Welcome everyone. My name is Alexi Lavecchio and I'm the, uh, the National Forest Organizer with KS Wild. Uh, with me here from KS Wild is Joseph Thale, who will be helping to assist this webinar. Also with us here from Lomakotsi Restoration Project is Belinda Brown, the Tribal, Ship, the Tribal Partnership Director, who will be tonight's moderator, and Tom Greco, Lomakotsi's Communications Manager, who will be monitoring the Q&A box. Uh, we are super excited to continue the Fire and Climate Summit webinar series with the third webinar, the first best stewards, Aboriginal fire and the Klamath Siskiyous. And so before we get started, we just want to go over a couple of Zoom tips. Um, we recommend a screen viewing option for everyone. So not everyone's computer offers this option, but if you take a look at the top of your screen, you will see a box that says view option, or it may just say options. Um, click that and then select the side-by-side -side setting. This will show all the panelists on the right-hand side of the screen with their PowerPoint presentations in the middle. If you have any question during the presentation, type them into the Q&A box, which is located in your Zoom control panel at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question for a specific panelist, please address that panelist by name in your question. We will save time at the end of all the presentations for a Q&A session where we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Um, your chat feature will be disabled. So again, please use the Q&A box for all inquiries as all attendees will be on mute for the entire webinar. Lastly, you can leave the webinar at any time by clicking the leave webinar button located at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for tonight's event, Belinda Brown. Oops. Hello, everybody. My name is Belinda Brown, and I'm from the Koselekta Band of the Ajumawi Atsage Nation. And thank you for joining us here tonight for all the participants that are here in this third webinar series of the KS Wild and Lomakotsi sponsored um, Aboriginal Fire for the Klamath and Siskiyous. We just really appreciate your attendance here and we have an expert panel here tonight and we hope that you enjoy this. And as you are um, here with us, I am going to tell you a little bit about my homeland and my homeland in the Koselekta Band of the Ajumiwi Atsage Nation is from the Sagebrush Steppe Habitat. It's a cultural landscape that has been shaped by Aboriginal people for time immemorial. And we're going to hear about the Indigenous people and time immemorial fire, Aboriginal fire on our landscape that provided and created ecological diversity and maintained abundant landscape for a subsistence lifestyle. The antelope and the, excuse me, the junipers are very uh, traditional cultural beneficial resources for us. They're medicines, they're foods, they're abundant resources on our land that our people have been utilizing again for time immemorial. These resources and cultural uses of our lands that we are going to talk about here tonight with these cultural fire experts, with uh, academia here, we are fortunate to have Dr. Doug Bird with us, who's actually uh, lived with our people in these lands with the Gadutica Band of the Northern Paiute people. And across all of these lands and the Klamath Siskiyous are the homelands of many of our tribes and they were displaced uh, during these times of colonialism. And we hope that we can convey to you the importance of maintaining these lands. This is the XL reservation that you're looking at up in Modoc County, California. And this is meadow systems. This is where I burned with my grandfather and my father myself on these lands to maintain the vitality and the cultural revitalization of our resources and of our way of life. 
So you can see the encroachment of juniper. And we're going to look at the encroachment of juniper, of ponderosa pine, of releasing these legacy junipers and these legacy pines for cultural revitalization and also to help build restoration economies and to bring people back to the land. We need many hands on the land now to help us to restore the lands to what they should be. We have a river there called the Pitt River. And this is actually called Ajum in our language. Ajum means river. Ajuma we is, is we are the people from the river. And that's really important as we all know that water is life and our life comes from the water. We are water. We are made up of water, dust, and air. And so we are all part of those natural elements. And I'd like you all to just go back in time in your own way to think about this land and the people and where you come from and where you're indigenous from because we're all indigenous to some place on this globe. McJunawi, Hadachi, Takadi, Dati. That means we're children from the heart of Mother Earth. And we're all part of the work that needs to be done today. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of the work that needs to be done. And I'd just like you again to settle into the understanding and the knowledge that you are all part of this work and you are children from the heart of Mother Earth. This is a picture of the Goose Lake Valley up by New Pine Creek, Oregon, California, where the border is. And this is what they call an ecocultural refugium where it's been basically untouched, where you see the medicinal plants, you see the water, and it's one of those places that we very much are held sacred in our hearts because this is the place where we can go and heal. This is the place where we can go and gather our cultural, medicinal, and food plants. Mainly Aboriginal people put fire on the ground for their food sources, and this was managed very, very well because their survival depended on it. This is uh, my son and myself uh, near a petroglyph up again by Goose Lake Valley in our Hewasi Dawi area. And we are celebrating our time on the land together. And I actually spoke with my son this afternoon who's going out fly fishing. And one of the things that he loves to do is go and be at one with the land. And that peace and that healthy feeling that you get from being on the land, like he explained to me this afternoon as he fly fishes. It's that fluid sense of being one with yourself and with the creatures that you're living with and having the respect for all of the people that we're living with and the creatures. And our elders tell us when we live and when we live in the natural rhythms of the earth, sea, and heavens, and eat what we gather and grow in the environment that we're in, that we're always going to be healthier and happier in the environment that we're in, and take care of each other in that way, in the land and the environment that we live in. So I'm just fortunate to have a, a son who does respect that. This was the boarding school experience, and this is a little bit of a a hard picture to look at, but when people were displaced from the land, um, it suffered. The land suffered, the people suffered, and what we're trying to do tonight, tonight with this expert panel is to uh, bring some knowledge and awareness. When the people were removed from the land, like my grandfather who was taken to boarding school, uh, five years old, he didn't speak English, he was taking, and this removal from the land impacted what has happened now with over 100 and 150 years of uh, management that didn't do too well. So we excluded fire. Fire was looked at as something that was wrong. And so now we're trying to bring fire back and we are still here. Our people are still here all across the nation. Our people are here working together, trying to come together to reverse some of the damage that's been done with fire being removed from the land. And I'd like to uh, welcome and very privileged and honored to have the panelists that we have tonight. This has been uh, co-hosted by Lomakatsi Restoration Project. Lomakatsi is the Hopi word for life in balance. And we try to bring that life in balance, but we need all of our partners and all of you to make this work.
and we're very fortunate to have you. So now I would like to introduce, um, and these are some more slides before I introduce Dan Wapapa um, of Restoring Ecosystem, Enhancing Tribal Economies. But I'd like to introduce Dan Wapapa now. And he's been in the Valley for over 30 years. He's been accepted and adopted by our elders. He's uh, respected as a cultural bearer in our community. He's Anishinaabe and Kikapu, Meskwakam. And he is here with us tonight to open us and to open us in what that fire means to us ceremonially as a people. And we hope that you can just join us in this journey from the past, bringing the traditions from our past and weaving them into our eco-cultural restoration as we go forward to provide a better future for climate adaptation, for what we all can do to bring the answers to the people, to address the wildfires that we're facing, the smoke, and the climate change that we have experienced these last few years. So thank you very much. Dan Wapapa is the founder of Red Earth Descendants. He also broadcasts on First Nations Radio. So Dan, thank you very much. Wow, miigwech. Anin relatives. Nindijitikaz wapishki miigwem. Migizi, nindodem. Zagaswa, Jamaicaag. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, this is my formal introduction. I told you my clan and where I'm from and my name. And so, uh, and we all speak this way as native people uh, to introduce each other to everyone. And I'm going to say a little short prayer uh, uh, as well. I'm Belma, I know. It's my do, my do, my my key. Look how Dutchman I am, it's not big, my win. Which one in on? You know, Marzi win, maybe with Marzi win. So we know uh, uh, there are different kinds of fires. Um, we have Anishinaabeg uh, Ishkure, uh, which is uh, the people's fire, you know, we cook with and pray with. We have Beneshi uh, Ishkure, um, uh, which is uh, the Thunderbird uh, fire, uh, shoots out of this copper ice, and lands on the earth and starts fire, and those are very sacred fires. Um, we have uh, the, the, the ravaging fire, um, we have uh, the tame fire, you know, we have white man's fire. Uh, the white man's fire is electricity. And so <clears throat> uh, at some point, uh, uh, the, the European cultures has lost touch with their fires. And so, and this is a, how we used to know each other uh, at some point as human beings is how we lit our fires and how we shared our fires. So the, uh, uh, I come from a people, uh, Anishinaabe, we have uh, the seven fires prophecy. And the Seven Fires Prophecy uh, basically uh, a lot of it uh, pertained to our migration from the Eastern Seaboard to where the food grows on water. And so uh, we have to uh, um, be able to, uh, uh, hey Jen, can you get this cat? So we have to be able to uh, be able to uh, uh, recognize that we are in the seventh fire right now. And the seventh fire is uh, uh, where the people are instructed to change their ways because uh, the white man was coming and he uh, uh, proved to be uh, um, very destructive and it's known by the poisons in the waters uh, and it's known by uh, the fish being killed. 
and uh, un un inedible, you know. It's no, we are right now in a crossroads of prophecy, you know, of native prophecies. So there's a, a, a all kinds of stuff that uh, uh, natives us uh, view this time here as, you know. Uh, the reason we have these wildfires is because of the losing of touch of the sacred ways that we deal with fire and the land. So um, it's my thought, I don't know this, but it's a guess that uh, I felt this entire country went from coast to coast on a two year cycle, uh, burns every two year cycle. There's a, a group, a, a brule, a Sioux, a Sikanju, uh, they're known as burnt thighs because they had to run against the fire, they mistimed the fire. And so they had to run against the, the fire in the grasslands and so, uh, and all that fire in the grasslands created the breadbasket, all the, the rich, rich fertility. Uh, um, uh, uh, the fire uh, uh, helped us to bring in game. It helped keep this, uh, the diseases down, the pests down, the fungus down. Uh, as far as I know, maybe the, the fire might have helped the American chestnut out there um, um, before it went away. So, um, and so we are reestablishing our relationship with fire. We are transitioning from, as the Hopi say, uh, the white medicine bundle, which is the fire medicine bundle, to the uh, uh, red medicine bundle, which is the earth medicine bundle. So us native people, us indigenous people carry this earth medicine bundle uh, and have carried it very well. Um, for example, the Inca, uh, they have developed more varieties of edible fruit or, and food that, uh, uh, than all the tribes of Europe has. So. Uh, that's how we took care of our, our earth medicine bundle. This earth medicine bundle was handed down to us native people uh, uh, and as a medicine bundle for all. And so depending on where we live, it reflects differently, this earth, this medicine bundle. So we could be river people, we could be plains people, we could be woodlands, you know, we could be desert people. And those cultures, those ways are different uh, because the land creates the culture. So, uh, and the land combined with our medicine bundle gave us our ways, gave us our cultural ways, gave us our languages, our sacred languages. Because these are special sacred languages that we speak here on this turtle island, this spiritual island right here. So we, uh, uh, I appreciate this panel, their expertise on bringing back the relationship that we have with what is sacred, this fire. This fire is a spirit. We use it to purify. Uh, we use it to uh, burn. Uh, uh, and so during this time of the seventh, uh, a fire, the Anishinaabe Seven Fires Prophecy, you can research that online, uh, is that uh, uh, the people need to change their ways, otherwise face destruction. There's a fire coming, and this fire can be destructive or it can be life-giving. So we are at that point right now uh, as, as people around the world, uh, all relatives around the world are, are in the same situation that we are in. Um, we've known for a long time that we are going to be in a purification that was going to happen in my lifetime. You know, we as Native people believe that we chose our parents, we chose the time that we're here, and we also got a brief glimpse of the potential of our life. You know, so we chose this. Uh, we designed ourselves to be here, given the skill sets that we are right now, in order to contribute to life because that's what we need to do as human beings is contribute to life. And the fire is a, a great healer. So we will need to be able to reestablish, again, our connection with fire as a sacred being, as a spirit, as something to be respected and work with and as a partner. So I appreciate your time and I'm gonna leave it to the true professionals now, the experts. So thank you. And thank you for that, Danny. I greatly appreciate that, the ceremonial and sacred use of fire and how we're all a part of that. And again, indigenously, if you go back to your roots, you will find that you go back to a drumming and a singing and a dancing society. And somewhere on the land, your people probably put fire on the ground and burnt for their plants and their cultural foods. So I appreciate that, Danny. We're gonna move on now to the um, cultural Fire Management Council team that has done amazing work down in the Yurok territory and is part of the Klamath Siskiyou region that we serve here. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, 
these folks. And one of the things that uh, Rick O'Rourke says, who's one of the presenters tonight, is that it's the first agreement that we have with our creator is to take care of our land and to be good stewards of the land. So tonight, as we go on with the first best stewards of the land, I'd like to introduce Margot Robbins. She is the co-founder and president of the Cultural Fire Management Council. She is one of the key planners and organizers of the Cultural Burn Training Exchange treks that takes place on the Yurok Reservation twice a year. She is also a co-lead and advisor for the Indigenous Peoples Burn Network. Margot comes from the traditional Yurok village of Morak and is enrolled member of the Yurok tribe. She gathers and prepares traditional food and medicine, is a basket weaver and regalia maker. She is the Indian Education Director for the Klamath Trinity Joint Unified School District, a mom and a grandmother. Richard O'Rourke III is an Indigenous Fire Practitioner and the Fire Coordinator for the Cultural Fire Management Council. He is a Yurok Tribal member, has lived on the banks of the Klamath River for the majority of his life. He has been using fire as a defensive tool against wildfire for over 30 years. As fire coordinator for the CFMC, he has started using fire on a landscape level for the revival of cultural resources, fuel reduction, and returning the landscape to a healthy, biologically diverse ecosystem. And Elizabeth Asus is of Yurok and Karuk descent. She grew up in the traditional Yurok village of Wichpec where she currently resides. She is a cultural practitioner, gathering and propagating traditional food and medicinal plants. She is the Cultural Fire Management Council Board of Directors Secretary, a key planner for treks, responsible for logistics and permitting. She is an active community member, a mom and a grandmother. And I'd also like to share a word from our good friend up to the north, uh, Robert Kinta, from the Siletz tribe, Iuki, and uh, welcome Cultural Fire Management Council. Uh, appreciate you being here tonight, and it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Iuki Neknamar Mechak, the traditional village of Morick. Thank you for inviting us to be here. We really appreciate this opportunity to, um, to share um, what we do here in our homelands. I want to pull up screen share now, hopefully. Hmm. <laughs> so fire came to the Europe people the, in the beginning times before we lived here in this sphere of existence there was a pre race of spirit beings inhabited this place and they created the world the way we know it our name for those spirits is wage it was the wage spirit beings that created the plants and the animals the rocks the rivers they spoke them into being After the land was uh, ready for human beings and human, be human beings were coming to this place, some of those spirit beings took physical form and stayed. And those are the things that we see around us today, the different kinds of trees, the rocks, the creeks. And so what we see in our natural world are, are the generation of those original Wage spirit beings. Some of the spirit beings left this, this realm of existence and, and, and went 
went away, but before they left, there was a period of time when humans and those and those beings shared this space. Time, the spirit beings taught us how to live. They taught us what was good for food, what was good for clothing, plants to use for baskets, how to use baskets to cook, to to carry our babies for traps, to lift up prayer. They gave us our, our ceremonial dances that we might, might connect with Creator to give, to give thanks and, and to ask that um, the help to, to keep this place in balance the way it was given to us. Before the spirit beings left, one of the gifts that they gave us was fire. They went up to the sky world and they stole fire. And in order to bring it back, it took many different kinds of spirit animals. There was bear, there was eagle, there was all these different different kinds of, of animals that they passed the fire from one to the next until finally the final animal that had it was frog. And he took the the fire into his mouth and he went down the water because when the Wapeka Mau, that was the name of the uh, one of the most powerful beings, when they first stole it, they, um, they were chased. And so that's why they had to um, transform one animal to the next. And so the frog, he took it into his mouth and he hid under the water and that was chasing them, trying to get their fire back, eventually got tired of waiting and they went away. And frog came up and he spit it into, into the roots of the willow. And so that's why we traditionally use the willow as the sticks that we use to make fire. And we were taught how to, um, to use those sticks to make fire and how to, um, how to cook our food with it and to do all of these things. It was a gift to us before the Wage spirit beings le left. And also before they left, those ones that agreed to stay, they said, yes, I will stay, but, but these are the things that you need to do in as an agreement for us to stay and those agreements is that we will take care of them physically and spiritually and they in turn would also take care of us physically and spiritually and the fire was one of the gifts that was given to us primary gift to take care of this creation of this place that we where we live so that was the beginnings in the beginning times since that time, we went thousands and thousands of years of using fire to take care of the land, to keep the land in balance, to keep the food plentiful and, and healthy, to, uh, to make sure that the medicine plants were abundant, available, and to have plenty of, of cordage. Uh, we used a loof, um wild iris for, for string and took our nets to catch the fish in, in, the, uh, in the river. And, and so um, that's how we took care of this place and it provided for us. And all of the land around us had a different regime, a different regime of how often it would be burned. If you were burning for hazel, then you might burn every three to five years. Hazel is the, um, the plant that we use for the frames of our um, And it doesn't produce new shoots unless it is burned. Our culture is fire dependent Baskets are at the center of our culture. We use them from the time our babies are born until the time people pass on to the next world. We carry our babies in baskets. We make baskets to, to cook with, to eat with, to lift prayer. When a person passes on, we make a small plate basket and feed their spirit for several days um, as they pass on to the next world. And so 
about a hundred years ago when the when fire was taken away from us and we weren't allowed to use it it was a huge option to our culture another disruption to our culture was when the um during the boarding school times when people were stolen away and and taken away from home, raised up to be ashamed of who they were it was a huge disruption to put it nicely and so those traditions those fire chains that we had followed for thousands of years the knowledge started to be lost and it started to be used less frequently the places that used to be kept open as prairie lands being, were encroached on by fir trees the places that used to be uh, gathering places for acorns were encroached on. The, the land was just very out of balance and has been that way for a long time now. The Cultural Fire Management Council has set a goal for ourselves that we will reclaim the traditions of our, our ancestors. We will reclaim our right to use fire. We will not take no for an answer that, that not doing fire is not an option. We have been burning for about seven or eight years now. Our babies are once again being packed in baby baskets. There are more and more basket weavers in our community. We are taking our responsibility to take care of the land with fire very seriously. We know that the, the ability to use fire and bring it back in its full usefulness, not only as a land restoration tool, but as, as a spiritual connection to this place, that is gonna take time probably more time than we have here on earth. And so one of our goals is that we will continue on to the next generations, bigger, better, with deeper understandings. We just want it. We just want it to stay on the first slide. Yeah. yeah. Good evening. Uh, my name is Zeus. Um, Aikui, Ayuki. Um, welcome. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm the secretary for cultural fire management, and I also run the food securities division, which means that when I'm not learning, I am planting. Um, Cultural Fire Management Council is a multi-generational organization. We teach our children about who they are and what fire means to us as a people. Ceremony is our center. It's our balance. It's who we are. Fire is our heart. It heals our and our souls. Fire is family. We ask the creator to guide us, to help cleanse the land, to restore our hazel, our traditional foods, and our medicines and allow our and healthy. We've been working with multiple government agencies and we have continued to grow as an organization trying to maneuver the BIA and the NEPA requirements so that we can get our burn plans approved, which will allow us to improve our forest for our future generations. We are uh, basically an oral culture. We don't have a written culture, so we tell stories. We talk to our children who we are and how important fire is to us as a people, how it rears our land, how it cleanses us. Um, it gets rid of the weevils that 
to destroy our acorns, um, insects that infest our basket materials. Um, my personal favorite being out in a fire is watching the elephant roll around in the ash after we finished burning. It's one of the amazing things you can see is the animals being happy to have fire on the ground. I grew up at the traditional village of Wichpec at the confluence of the Klamath and Trinity rivers where I was taught medicine as a young woman. So I gathered those medicines in the mountains where I was taught by my elders and being able to walk those mountains, being able to touch those plants, to smell the smells that come after fire is rejuvenating to me as a human being. It touches in a way that nothing else touches me. Fire literally makes me cry, it makes me happy. It gives me hope in our future generations that now that we're telling them these stories again, now that we're talking to them about it, now that we're allowed to burn, um, not as often as we would like to, we're uh, working through the, the fire exemptions, I guess, the restrictions, the plans that are put in place by other organizations that have no idea how important it is to clean the land on a daily basis. Um, I burn when it's raining, I burn when it's sunny, I burn whenever I can get away with it. So you might be slightly a firebug. <laughs> I have been burning since I was four years old. My grandfather caught me playing with matches. My grandfather was blind, so he could see what I was up to. And he thought it was the greatest thing to have to sit me down and explain how important fire was to us, how we cook our food, how we cleanse our land, how we care for it because it's family and it cares for us. Praying for these things has been a lifelong goal of mine to make this happen. To be able to be here, to work with this amazing group of people has really made my heart sing. And so thank you very much for having us here. Okay, I guess it's me. How you doing? I'm Rick O'Rourke. Uh, it's indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, thanks for having us in your home. Let me start with um, uh, reiterating the fact that uh, we have been in this place since the very beginning of time for thousands and thousands of years. And we've never been displaced from, this, from where we are since the beginning of time. And it's been working up until about 130 years ago until uh, um, the exclusion of fire and uh, persecution that um, endeavored. But in that, the land it remembers there. And that fire, it remembers our land. And bringing them back together is like reintroducing two friends that haven't seen each other for a long, long time. And sometimes they get excited and want to get carried away but we try to mitigate. Um, in that, we see fire as a keystone element in our medicine circle, and it's been one that's been for, for quite some time. And the reintroduction to this, to who we are and our ceremony is really important. And um, in all things, we start with prayer. And our prayer goes up before I go into where we're going to start burning. I try to get the feel of it, try to go back 300 years and see what it used to be. So I can try to come up with a plan so in three or 400 years, it could be what it was. Um, fire is in our DNA. You know, it's imprinted on us. And the teachings and knowledge has been embedded in us for thousands of years. And when we're ready for it, it'll unlock and it'll be available to us. And it has been. Um, in that, uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to thank some of our partners who made this possible. I would like to thank the Nature Conservancy, and the Fire Learning Network, the Crook Tribe, the Yurok Tribe, Yurok Wildfire, the Klamath Watershed Council. Um, Humboldt Area Foundation, CAL FIRE, CDF, uh, all of our community members and our volunteers and, and just the people 
um, the Klamath Trinity Unified School District, who has been implementing um, the knowledge in a multi-generation to our young ones. Um, let's see, a firestorm and wood fire and woods. Lomakatsi, there you go. Hey, you guys are awesome. Um, the Fire Safe Clubs from HSU, OSU, um, Lania Quinn Davison, who's been in, like an inspiration. Uh, dead hair, cow smoke, and uh, tracks, and uh, everybody who is just, I've had this um, exposure to so much knowledge that it is indeed humbling. Um, so, talk, talk about our capacity and resources and building, and we have actually quite a few in our tracks module. It's where we're trying to bridge the gap between NWCG qualifications and traditional economic. Economic, ec ecological knowledge, <laughs> excuse me. And um, we, start, we started with training firefighters and now we've evolved into training fire practitioners and changing the look and the application of fire into our landscape with a different level of understanding the earth and not just head firing a fire to fight a fire. We go in there, we pre-tree and in this uh, fuel heavy environment and topography is insane. Um, we have overcome this because I don't see things as problems, they're opportunities for solutions and we can mitigate and navigate through that with good clear understanding of safety as our first priority. Um, we've trained over 500 firefighters, well, not trained them, but help them um, in their qualifications to move forward through their uh, careers. Um, we've moved higher to over 800 acres. And in this uh, watershed, you know, anybody who knows fire knows that this, this, it's no joke. Um, let's see. We're looking at fire. Fire and people who have been in uh, student for like you know 25 years have come to our tracks and we've become friends and family and and peers with respect that I can't even talk about. It blows my mind the cohesion that happens in a week, but changed the idea of fire in just seven days. It, it's it's amazing. Um, restoring, putting the fire on the ground to me, like applying prayer, and as the first gentleman, it is earth medicine, and the application of medicine, if you take too much medicine, it's bad, but we all need a little sometimes. Uh, fire is the sharpest tool in our shed. Um, we have, um, extreme complex fire situations to where in any one unit, we could have several goals and objectives, which would range from the um, cultural resources to removing invasives, to um, opening up the canopy, to restoring prairie, to push back and encroaching trees, to reclaim our prairies. Um, you know, uh, carbon sequestration, which is a part of the knowledge of when to burn in between storm windows so that the, uh, so the storm will put out the fire and essentially start creating a landscape-wide carbon sequestration. And in, okay, and okay, so um, I could go on and on. I'd like to say that uh, I've been working up in uh, Thompson Creek in the Applegate. We're doing a vanity burn with some really super great people up there, and it's a joy to work with. Um, uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who helped bring this together and all the hard work behind the scenes. And um, it's great working with these folks. I think that's my. You have more time. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The, okay. Well, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> uh, let me go back to this one. Um, well, as, as 
um, Anthony and Elizabeth have said that, you know, working in, in the, with our landscape is that we're creating a fire resilient landscape and a fire adapted landscape. And we are inserting ourselves into that landscape as stewards and taking the responsibility creating a connection, a both physical and spiritual connection with our young people and, to, you know, our tribal members and to see who we are to our land and what it means to us and what we mean to it in order to get in our harmony. And we pray hard and we work hard and this is, we will not fail at. Um, it's not an option. And as was been stated before, um, and for somebody that I could train to take my up since I started it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, that being said, you know, it's it, it's the most humbling and the empowering and the true understanding that if you're gonna lead, you, it, it's 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 a land of you have to serve, it's the servitude and. I'm okay with that. I don't know how much time I have left. <laughs> well, you we're, still have three minutes. We're getting, I still have three. We're getting there, Rick. So um, we can move okay. on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And you've just heard from the Cultural Fire Management Council, uh, Yurok tribal members that are working hard on their land down there, bringing cultural Aboriginal burning back to restore the plants, the animals, and the lifestyles, and that sacred ceremony of fire being good medicine for the land. And next, uh, we have a treat. We have a Dr. Doug Bird. He's the Associate Professor of Anthropology and Faculty in the Graduate Programs of Ecology and human dimensions of natural resources and in the Pennsylvania State University. He's also the director of the Center for Human Ecology at Penn State and he's the co-director and principal investigator of Human Environmental Dynamics Lab and we're so honored to have you here Doug, Dr. Bird tonight and thank you. Oh, Belinda, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge and honor the traditional owners and holders of sacred knowledge on this panel, uh, especially in their monumental efforts uh, in maintaining and revitalizing traditional practice that's so vital to our ecosystems around the world. Uh, it's a real privilege to learn about and participate in, in those efforts. I'm gonna share my screen now. So first of all, um, I'm going to introduce you briefly uh, to the importance of indigenous fire on the other side of the planet. Um, in places around the world with profound histories of traditional practice, indigenous livelihoods and knowledge become fundamental components of healthy ecosystems. And this is especially so for people that depend on cultural burning. For the last couple of decades, I've had the privilege of living and working closely with indigenous communities in Australia's western desert many of whom refer to themselves as Mardu. Today, um, uh, Mardu are the exclusive owners of an area of native tidal lands encompassing over 136,000 square kilometers of Australia's western desert. Uh, while some Mardu had sporadic interaction with European settler colonialism prior to World War II, many remote groups were first contacted in the 1960s and their traumatic exodus from their homelands was precipitated in part by the establishment of a nuclear missile testing range in the heart of their country. By 1967, the last remaining groups in this part of the desert were cleared from their homelands or walked into missions and pastoral stations to the west. As a result of the structural violence of settler colonialism, and the direct threat that this unleashed on Mardu autonomy and their homelands, 
Many from those last contact groups returned to their country in the 1980s, where their families continue now to work hard at maintaining important components of their traditional practices, especially those that revolve around cultural burning of the landscape. <clears throat> For Mardu, it is in the context of hunting, especially monitor lizard hunting, that cultural burning is especially important, and especially for women. More than 80% of all broadcast fires are set in order to clear off an overburden of large areas of spinifex grassland to improve encounters with denned sand monitor lizards during the cool dry season of the year. During this season, there's no other source of ignition in the Western desert and a distinctive landscape resulting from these kinds of cultural burns emerges. In an important ecological feedback, then populations of monitor lizards in turn depend upon the landscapes that are created by hunters that burn frequently. These landscapes broke down when Aboriginal people were cleared from their homelands and patch mosaic burning for hunting purposes ceased. And without indigenous burning in the span of less than 30 years, the frequency and seasonality of fire ignition shifted dramatically, leading to an average increase in wildfire size by more than two orders of magnitude. Fires got bigger, they got hotter, and they quickly became more destructive as they shifted to burn mainly in the hot summer months of the early dry season. These images here show newly burned fire footprints in red at three at times in two different areas, beginning with aerial photography that was taken in 1953 in preparation for the government patrols that would be contacting folks uh, for, uh, in, in, in advance of the establishment of the nuclear missile testing range. Um, so uh, this is uh, 1953, before European invasion, when Mardu were burning at both Site 1 and Site 2 here. You can see that very soon after Mardu were cleared from their homelands, by 1973, the number of fires collapses and the fire sizes increase dramatically. By 2003, they had returned and had been regularly hunting and burning for a number of years at Site 2 but had never been back to site one and their return to site two then shifted fires back to the size and seasonality that'd been during the 1950s. While at the other site, under the influence of climate change, fires just continued to get larger. The Mardu fire regime clearly functions to buffer against the effects of climate driven cycles of aridity and the spread of devastatingly large wildfires. Drone imagery even gives you a better sense of the scale of the difference in different uh, and diversity of vegetative patchiness with and without Mardu burning. This shot shows a landscape located about 50 kilometers from where people normally hunt, where lightning fires cause most of the, um, uh, um, uh, of the burns. Only uh, two fire age classes are visible, visible in this image, right? One that includes old growth from tiny remnants of unburnt vegetation, um, that um, last burned in the summer of 2002. And all of that potential diversity of vegetation at different stages of regrowth has been wiped out by a large wildfire that moved through in 2011. And this is a drone shot at the same altitude, but located in and located in the same habitat type that I showed you before, right, in the spinifex grasslands, but it's in a region that's frequently used for wintertime burning to hunt for monitor lizards. There are a minimum of five different burn ages that are represented in the same area. The diversity of different kinds of vegetative communities at different stages of regrowth is dramatically greater where Mardu burn more frequently. Through ecological surveys that were designed by and conducted in collaboration with the Mardu communities, we found that the diversity resulting from cultural burning has a big positive effect on most native species, including dingoes and monitor lizards and kangaroos, while it doesn't increase the populations of invasive predators like cats and foxes. And those effects of then cultural fire reverberate through the food web supporting many animals that are themselves keystone species, such as dingoes who compete with the smaller invasive cats and foxes and prevent those invasives from driving small native species extinct. 
through overpredation. Uh, the way that Mardu Burn provides native animals with better access to cover and food because they can more easily access unburnt vegetation when fires are small and the landscape is patchy. Smaller animals who are in a landscape dominated by lightning driven fire regimes are really vulnerable to predators, especially when new invasive predators are coming in and there's no people or dingoes to hunt those invasives. So that hiatus of indigenous fire precipitated an ecological um, catastrophe. Oh, hold on just one sec, let me go back here. <clears throat> that hiatus then of indigenous fire precipitated a, 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 a massive ecological uh, catastrophe that resulted in the biggest loss of mammal species ever recorded over the last 200 years. Since European settlement, um, the highly distinctive land mammals of Australia have suffered an extraordinary rate of extinction. 11% of all native terrestrial taxa have, been, have gone extinct and a further 21% are now assessed as being endangered or critically endangered. And in the desert, in the two decades during which cultural fires were completely absent, Mardu country experienced the loss of over half of their native mammal species. Over the last two centuries, no other continent on earth has witnessed such a loss. And it turns out that the really broad um, environmental and social implications for failing to support the autonomy of indigenous livelihoods in these ecosystems. Remote Aboriginal communities are really constantly under threat of closure from the government with disparities between indigenous and European communities that are often cast in terms of the lack of employment opportunities or lack of commitment that folks like Mardu have for engaging with the quote, real economy, such as mining. However, in the context of contemporary aspirations among many remote living Mardu, Devaluating, uh, devaluating their 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 values, um, their livelihoods, uh, in pursuit of you know market-based opportunities of employment is extremely costly to the public at large. If we consider the costs of prescribed burning alone, Mardu simply by supporting their communities with traditional resources, supply the public ecosystem services that far outweigh subsidies that government supplies and community operating costs. On average, the value of hunting with fire includes a public savings of between half a million to $2 million per year in each of the Mardu communities. These are just the ecosystem services that Mardu foragers supply in prescribed burning. It doesn't include even the value added from the daily acquisition of healthy resources or the maintenance of endemic species through habitat restoration or the maintenance of clean water sources or the control of invasive species. Uh, in Mardu country, then attitudes and policies that discourage customary hunting and burning practices will perversely undermine federal and state conservation man uh, mandates that they have to promote biodiversity, let alone the international agreements um, in place that are designed to support indigenous rights and sovereignty. In light of recent disasters of devastating wildfires in Australia and California, I have a lot of hope that land management policies are now realizing that solving these big environmental dilemmas actually depends critically on recognizing the dignity and ecological importance of indigenous lives. So that's all I had. I hope, um, I hope this was uh, interesting to give you a, a bit of perspective on a very different um, uh, um, place uh, in the world. I'll um, stop sharing my screen now. Hello, thank you for that, Doug, and thank you for all the panelists. And I'd like to remind everybody in this uh, kind of awkward virtual reality that we're in right now, that we uh, you please use your question and answer box. We are taking questions and we'll be fielding those uh, real soon here. So we would like to introduce our Southern Oregon University interns at this time. 
I'd like to introduce Duranda Hinky. She's been working with us uh, since the beginning of the year, putting together all the details and gathering interviews and traveling down to Yurok territory today to uh, assist our practitioners down there with all the technology that we need. So uh, thank you, Duranda. And I would like to introduce you and have you tell us where you're from and what you've learned through this experience and what is your takeaway? Tribal member with Fort McDermott Paiute Shoshone Tribe. And that's located near the Nevada and Oregon border. Um, I'm also a graduating senior uh, from Southern Oregon University with a degree in environmental science and policy. Um, so as you know, I've been interning for Lomkatsi and I'm really grateful. It has taught me so much about uh, ind Indigenous fire and how to work with partnerships and what it means to have a solid foundation in ecological principles. It has also opened the doors for me to listen to those with traditional ecological knowledge. So all this has brought in my perspective on fire management and has brought um, my education at SUU to real life and how Lo Makatsi and others are restoring ecosystems and fire on the ground. So thank you, Belinda and Lo Makatsi, for this opportunity to expand my experience in this field and my overall knowledge. And thank you, KS Wild, for letting me help with this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. And so here's Tuli. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tuli O'Rourke. I'm a Yurok Tribal member and I'm a graduating senior at Southern Oregon University. Um, I'm getting my degree in environmental science. So I grew up on the Yurok Reservation in uh, the village of Morick. Um, it's a very remote place. And from an early age, my dad always stressed the importance of putting fire on the land and how it can improve the conditions of the forest and river for all the species. Um, Ever since I can remember, the forest on the reservation has been very overgrown with brush. And so it's hard to do things that our people have always done, like gather basket materials, acorns, pick huckleberries, or hunt. Uh, since the, fi the Cultural Fire Management Council and others have been putting fire on the ground, it has already made a significant impact in a very short time. This internship with the Lomakati organization has been awesome and has allowed me to have conversations with some of the biggest experts in this field. Um, I would like to thank Belinda and Lomakati for this opportunity to help with this webinar, as well as KS Wild for helping me as well. Um, I'd also like to thank all the panelists for the hard work and dedication in bringing the land back to its natural balance. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And again, I uh, ask for all of you to use your question and answer box there. And we have a few more slides to go through here, so hang with us. And we're going to wrap this up with, we've been asked, getting a lot of questions about what are the solutions? How, how do we come now and, and try to right these wrongs and work together and uh, have the many hands on the lands that we need. So right now, uh, the, the landscape has changed and we're setting the stage for the reintroduction of cultural fire. This is a very uh, sensitive area. Uh, you can see the encroachment uh, of the Douglas fir into oaks. And so as the land is treated, you can see the legacy oaks that have been released. And then some of the restoration byproducts that come out of the forest now. Those are about 40, 50 year old trees that you're looking at. And these are the, what we call the eco-cultural restoration byproducts that actually help pay for the restoration that we need to do. So there you see again the, the millions of board feet, the trees that need to come out of the woods because of the 100 and 150 years of fire suppression and folks thinking that uh, fire was bad and that we need to suppress all the fire. So we have a lot of work to do and it's going to take many, many partners to do this. You're looking at now some of the Siletz tribal members putting fire on the ground. 
for some of the cultural basket weaving plants that we have. But everything that we're doing is really turning back that uh, biological clock and setting the stage for putting good fire on the ground. If you were to go out and do aboriginal burning today, uh, we'd have another wildfire let loose. So we don't want to do that. Everything we do is trying to reduce fuel loads and make it so that we can do more burning. This is the ECWA, Tribal Youth Ecosystem Workforce Program. This is workforce. We call it a three-legged stool. Loma is celebrating its 25th year. And we've been involved with uh, tribes and incorporated and listened to the elders, traditional elders teach us how to uh, bring folks together and get them excited. You heard some excitement tonight about people excited about putting fire on the land and treating this land and it helps the people heal. It helps our tribal people heal when they're working together and it really helps our youth to understand who they are culturally. Isiwa means the Indian way in our Ajuma Weatsuge language. We have our Hoopa uh, relatives in uh, agency positions. This is the Modoc National Forest where they, they're helping teach our youth. We have 20,000 acres down there that we are putting into a project just this year. And I'd like to say that Lomakasi and the partners here in, in the Rogue Basin, the Klamath Siskiyous have worked together to put over 15,000 acres uh, into treatment, uh, 50,000 acres in the Klamath National Forest, Wainema, forest, uh, 5,500 acres with the Karuk tribe, uh, tw the 20,000 acres in the Modoc National Forest, and a small little project down in Fall River Mills, California, where we burnt 20 acres for oak restoration, all done by tribal workforce. We have millions of acres that are in agreement right now with the Master Stewardship Agreement. And so I would uh, really like to encourage, again, everybody to be able to uh, work together. We're putting ecological forestry on the ground with our many tribal NGO agency and industry partners. It's taken everybody. We have what we call the Rogue Basin strategy here and it with uh, the Southern Oregon Forest Restoration Collaborative and our partners in the Klamath Siskiyou Oak Network and TNC who helps um, facilitate the TREX program that the Yurok tribe and the Cultural Fire Management Council is um, sharing about and just being able to really honor everybody's work. And thank you for listening in tonight. We're gonna to be ready to take uh, questions here pretty soon. I want to again say uh, the first best stewards of the land for time immemorial, we're honoring what the people have taught us and how we can weave those traditional practices into our solutions today. Uh, so again, Dan Wapapa, Margot Robbins, Elizabeth Asus, Richard O'Rourke, Dr. Doug Bird, thank you very much, Lomakatsi Restoration Project, and Meyer Memorial Trust for helping to fund all of us to do this, KS Wild, the Red Earth Descendants, the Cultural Fire Management Council, and our many partners across the region in Northern California, Oregon, and also across the nation who are helping to get this word out and helping to bring solutions to this issue. Questions? So how do the panelists envision working with or not working with the descendants of European invaders to bring fire back into balance. And um, Margo, would you like to take that one? Jim, could you repeat it? Could you repeat how, the question? Sorry. Yes. How do you envision working with or not working with the descendants of European invaders? to bring fire back into balance. Yeah, so we're willing to work with anybody who wants to come help us burn. We don't care what nationality they are. If people want to learn about fire and how to use it in a good way and the benefits, then we welcome you to come help. Um, that's my answer. <laughs> One of the ways that we uh, work with them is uh, through the TREX model. 
which is a training exchange. You have to have basic entry level qualifications. And we send the invitation to treks out far and wide across the United States and to other countries. And so we have a whole mix of different nationalities that come and help us burn our land. Just like in the Wage uh, spirit being times, it took many different kinds of animals to bring fire to the land. Mm -hmm. And it takes many different kinds of people to bring fire back to the land. On our reservation, we have many different um, land statuses. There is tribal fee, tribal trust, allotments. A good portion of it is owned by non-native people, but they want us to burn our land. And when they have cultural resources on their land and they're willing to let us come um, gather, then we don't mind uh, burning non-native land. Um, so, we welcome all help. Thank you for that, Margo. And I'd like to say that that's how we feel about it too. We like to say no matter what color earth suit that you're wearing, we need all hands on the land. So we'll uh, do another question now. The earth is faster now. How is traditional fire management impacted by the fact the earth is getting hotter and drier? It is not the same conditions now as for thousands of years in the past when fire was used. Time to use fire in a different way. What may have worked with the plants and animals in the past may not work now because of the change of climate. And I think Dr. Bird, you probably should take that one. Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, uh, let's see. I, did, I, I saw this question. I thought, oh man, that, that's a hard, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, well, uh, let's see. All right. Well, uh, uh, ask, ask the question again so that I can, I can, so I can think of a, of, 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 a, of a brief response. Okay. It, it, the earth is faster now. So the question is about how traditional fire management yeah. impacted uh, the land when it was the way it was, and now it's hotter and drier. It's not the same condition. So is it time to use fire in a different way? What may have worked with the plants and animals in the past may not work now because right. of the change of climate. I mean, I, 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 the, the, the short answer is, is of course, right? <laughs> but part of traditional ecological knowledge is being able to respond uh, in flexible ways and in adaptive ways to those changes. So there's a tremendous amount that we can still learn and, and incorporate with regard to traditional practices and knowledge about those practices that allows us to be able to deal with those climatic fluctuations. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, I mean, as many of the panelists have, have, have uh, articulated here, I mean, the situation that we deal with now in many places uh, in Western North America and in some places, uh, you know, um, uh, in Australia that have had devastatingly large wildfires, that's a result of over a century of suppression of indigenous fire, if not a complete exclusion of indigenous fire. So the ways in which we have to deal with that um, as, as Rick said, as many of the panelists said, it's going to have to recognize that you're now in a, in a very different kind of situation and you're going to have to deal with it in new kinds of ways. But the new kinds of ways have to acknowledge and recognize and incorporate um, the, 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 the deep histories, but profound traditions um, that shape those ecosystems in the first place. Thank you for that. I'm Would it be true? Oh, go ahead. Can I can I interject? Uh, would it be true that healthier forests uh, uh, sequester more carbon through uh, new plant growth, larger trees, and into the humus? I, I, I think Rick can answer that question really well. <laughs> go ahead, Rick. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that. Uh, um, in these times, we're going to get fire, but it's deciding on whose, you know, schedule we're going to get it. If we wait for Mother Nature to clean it up, we're in big trouble. So the best that we can do is um, 
just be dynamic in our thinking and keep safety in your mind. And um, if something doesn't work, rethink it, and try it again. You know, don't keep trying the same thing over because it usually won't work. Um, and it, it, when looking at any piece of land, you have to come up with your goals and objectives. What do you want it to look like? What are you trying to accomplish with putting fire through there? And in that, you could come up with a plan. Right. Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, Rick. And we'll go ahead and uh, get another question here. Is the knowledge of the use of fire available to everyone? Or is it the specialized knowledge of traditional Yurok and Karuk fire chiefs? Elizabeth, would you like to take that one? I wouldn't consider myself a fire chief. Um, uh, my grandfather taught me that the reason we have fire is because it was given to us as a directive from the creator to care for this planet that he put us on that she, I prefer to say, put us on. <laughs> um, fire knowledge may have been passed down through many cultures. For us, not having a written culture, I only know what was told to me by my elders. I know that there are certain times of the year that we need to burn. I know that there are certain plants that will burn better at certain times of the year. I have been a little more giving with my information than I normally would have been. I work with our children more. I work with some of our young people, teaching them who and what we are around fire. And I'm getting comfortable with the idea of sharing outside of our culture. Um, it's really difficult to give away pieces that we have been given by our elders. It feels like you're taking a piece of your heart and you're handing it to someone and they may not feel the same way about your heart that you do. So I'm very careful about how I share my knowledge, but I do believe that every last one of us on this planet is responsible for what's going to happen to us in the coming years. And thank you for that and appreciate that, that viewpoint. And uh, Danny, I'd just like to ask a, a question to you in, in regard to that ceremonial sacred use of fire. Uh, what would you say to our, our young people today, our, our, our student interns that are here with us, for what they could do to help us to go forward into the future? I uh, 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 maintain a relationship with that fire because that fire is a sacred thing. We have the fire within us as well. You know, and so uh, uh, off your tobacco in that fire, because that's part of where uh, that tobacco comes from. Uh, a little boy, a Sema, was born uh, at a time uh, that people were suffering. And so they called in all the bands, you know, to gather. Uh, and uh, the, this little boy, a Sema, he was a very special boy. He was, uh, uh, when the flowers grew around his lodge. When you talked to him, you received a healing, things like that, you know. But he was a little boy, and so when they called the council in to see what they could do about this uh, famine, disease, war, because the people had lost their way, um, then uh, uh, in walked Asema. They were coming up with no answers, but Asema walks in, and because of a special position he held amongst the tribe, they allowed him to speak at council. And so he says, I've had a vision that you must burn me at the stake, and this is the only way that we're going to get out of this. And because of the tribe says, no, Asema, you're going to be a, a, a powerful medicine person. You're going to be a speaker, a storyteller. You're going to be a great leader, you know, something. You'd be a great singer, you know, uh, whatever mm -hmm. it was. We're going to need you after we get through this. And so they denied his vision. A year went by, you know, and then half the tribe had died, you know. And again, they called in all the bands and had a grand council. And again, in walked Asema, and he says, I tell you that this is the only way that we're going to get out of this. And so they decided to burn Asema at the stake. And so when they did, they were to uh, receive instructions to come back a year later. And the year later, in the ashes of Asema was the first tobacco plant, you know. And so that tobacco carries both uh, Asema's sacrifice in it. So because when we say our prayers, we plug into natural law, you know, and that's a cycle, you know. Uh, we might get harmed because of that. No good deed goes unpunished has a basis in natural law. So that sacrifice of the same ones in there, also the potential of a Sema is in that tobacco. So when we pray, 
You know, we're praying with that sacrifice and that potential of a Sema. So pay attention to our cultural ways. That's the best way that we are going to, number one, preserve our reservations, because look at the Wampanoag, you know, uh, and uh, number two, be healthy, wholesome human beings, you know, is to have a relationship with that, with that tobacco and that fire. Yeah. Thank you very much for Thank that. You very much for that. that. I appreciate that ceremonial view, worldview uh, for the young people. It, it really helps. Um, the question here is about uh, the changing attitudes towards junipers in the high sage country. A massive destruction of junipers has taken place to benefit cattlemen. Uh, what are your current thoughts on that? And I'll go ahead and take that one, uh, Juniper Country, Costa Band. It means uh, where the Juniper Hillside is. And it's very near and dear to our heart and our elders' heart. And we feel the same way here at Loma Kotze about the Juniper as we do about uh, all the land and the species and the vegetation that we're trying to restore. And so we think it should be restored in a good way. Just like if I was to go to the doctor to get treatment for a certain disease, um, these lands have, have different needs. And so each land type that we go into, we try to make sure that first of all, we listen to the elders and what they know about the land and what those juniper trees mean to them as a medicinal, as making bows, as being a very cultural subsistence, uh, um, survival uh, element that we have up there. And what's happened is that again, there's encroachment. The juniper are much more dense than they used to be up there. And yes, we do have uh, agriculture. We have cattle grazing, which has not been the best practice for our land or our water. However, uh, as we look to the solutions, what are we going to do about that? So we look at making those treatments that are adaptive to the land and that are beneficial to the land, leaving old legacy juniper trees where the uh, elders actually uh, gleaned and picked those juniper berries. And then being uh, sensitive to the landscape and what we're doing, we don't just want to clear cut juniper, just like we don't want to clear cut anything, but we want to leave those mosaic patterns like natural fire uh, or Aboriginal fire would, like lightning caused fire or human caused fire would leave a mosaic pattern. And we try to do that when we thin too. So it's ecologically sound. It's not just coming in like industrial logging and, um, doing bad things to the land, but it's sitting back going and treating the land like you would a, a human, human being. It is our mother, it is our subsistence, it is our laboratory, our pharmacy, our uh, church, uh, and the springs that we have, the water of life. And so when you do thin around the springs, and uh, as a reforestation contractor long ago and far away, we did some of those contracts, uh, you will see springs come back. Junipers do take up a lot of water. So again, it's using the best science that we have, the best Western science that we have, and marrying that best Western science with the traditional ecological of the people who are place-based, who love their land and who love their juniper trees, and being able to get the best practice that we can out there on the land. And that takes collaboration. Uh, we actually uh, have formed the Intertribal Ecosystem Restoration Partnership, and anybody can be a part of that partnership as we go from project to project, from large landscape scale initiatives to another large landscape scale initiative. With whatever partners that we're working with, we try to make those treatments uh, directed to that land base and use the best practices that we have, taking everybody's thoughts, attitudes, opinions, feelings into account and being able to go out there in the field. And we've seen one of the best practices for us to be able to communicate these uh, treatments that we need to do is getting people out on the ground. Again, getting hands on the land, getting people to see it, touch it, feel it, makes a huge impact on what the common sense needs are that we need to do out there in the forest. We wouldn't let our backyards look like our forests look. So we need to be a little bit better caretakers and we need to all learn from each other to be able to do that in a good way. So um, here, here's one. Have, have you worked 
with the California Basket Weavers Association, who has worked with federal agencies to do prescribed burns in support of the endurance of basket weaving materials. And Margot or Elizabeth, would, uh, uh, Rick, would you, you like to take that? Um, we haven't really worked with the Basket Weavers Association. However, every time we do uh, a burn, which is twice a year, we always make sure that we are burning um, a place that has basket weaving materials on it. Um, hazel and perhaps a bear grass and we let the people in our area know um, when spring comes around where the place to gather um, basket materials is. Um, we do work with the government agencies. You have to work with government agencies in order to burn. For us, it's uh, usually CAL FIRE and the um, air quality people and, um, and sometimes the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So thank you for that. We have time for one more question here. Um, so this is for, for white people uh, looking to integrate native perspectives and traditional practices in fire management. How do you distinguish cultural appreciation from cultural appropriation. And uh, Dr. Bird, I'd, I'd like you to finish that up. We have a couple minutes left here. Really hard question. I <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I mean, first and foremost is uh, you, you, uh, you, know, you just have to have a deep, deep respect for indigenous communities, for indigenous people. Um, and, uh, and, um, you know, an, an outsider from, from any other place, uh, uh, is a neophyte. They, they know nothing, uh, about those, um, local circumstances. Um, uh, the question about, uh, appropriating, uh, indigenous practice, um, uh, uh, for, um, for other, uh, for for burning in other places, uh, I mean, uh, you know, what we have to know is what those other places need in terms of medicine, in terms of fire. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, it's really not a big an, an issue of cultural appropriation. It's using um, deep uh, histories, using um, deep traditions and important traditions and ecological knowledge that's local um, to understand those ecosystems and what they need. Um, uh, I'm just, I'm of course so um, pleased that all the panelists are so open to um, incorporating others um, and whatever uh, they can use um, to reinvigorate uh, um, uh, cultural fire in, in, in their homes, in their homelands. Thank you for that, Doug. And you've been hearing tonight from uh, the first best stewards of the land and our allies and how Aboriginal fire has helped shape the Klamath Siskiyous, the land that we love here, and how we are all going to work together on those solutions to be able to set the stage, to bring good fire back, and that we could all work together. Uh, teamwork makes the dream work. So thank you for this exceptional panel here tonight and for our partners who have helped us put this together. Okay, thanks everyone. Everyone, I am just going to close up the webinar, sharing my screen here. Yeah, so we just want to say thanks again for all your questions and the wonderful discussion. And thank you to our panelists. That was a really, really inspiring webinar. Um, just in closing, a reminder that we will send you all a follow-up email containing the resources covered during tonight's discussion, a link to watch the recorded webinar, and a follow-up survey to get your feedback. All this information will also be available at kswild.org and at lomakatsi.org. Um, also on the KS Wild website, you can find more information and registration links to the last webinar in the series, which is on next Thursday on May 28th, and it's called Reducing Fire Hazards in the Wildland Urban Interface. And so with that, we give a big thanks to our panelists and to everyone for joining us tonight. We hope you all enjoyed.